First thing in the morning, lamb necks. We take them, we trim any kind of like really excessive fat off. This is a marinade that we make that's made of comfy garlic, rosemary, and olive oil, and lemon. And then we're gonna put them just kind of sitting on top of some tin foil, because it's more like a rack. So then we'll take this and we'll wrap it in tin foil and we'll cook it really low and slow overnight. This one will be cooked Thursday night. We will press it on Friday and then we'll serve it on Saturday. So this is what the lamb neck looks like when it comes out of the oven. It needs to be hot. It has a lot of fat. So if it's not hot, you know, it's like a, it's a neck. <laughs> and you have to be able to pull it off and then press it. If it's cold, that's gonna be like very impossible. So for the lamb dish, we had a, like a lot of big ideas on how we were going to make this arrostroncini be really delicious and yummy. And we tried a few different things. You know, we tried kind of pressing a lamb belly with a braised shoulder. We kind of came to the conclusion that pressed neck was the best situation. I like keeping it intact. If we kind of tear it apart, it like loses all those little like fatty gelatinous pockets and that's like the part that's really texturally pleasing. And I'm gonna stick this in the fridge with a little bit of weight on top of it and then we'll cut it later. So this is for today's service and this was pressed overnight. As you can see, there's like a lot of fat and just pieces kind of pushed together. What we're gonna do for service is <laughs> cut this into square pieces. And there's two pieces per portion. If you look at the cube, you can see all the pieces of both protein and fat. And when we were testing this, it kind of made the most sense because it was the most cohesive and also like the most texturally pleasing. All the fat makes everything kind of crispy and moist. When we started working on this restaurant, we kind of decided that we wanted to change often because we wanted to invite people back in for something new. So one of the big projects for every day is breaking and wrapping the fluke. And Mindy, our fish roast, is going to do that with us. So the fluke dish, local to us, and it's the season. Um, it comes from Montauk, um, Long Island. We changed the menu on Tuesday, so this is my third day breaking down the fluke. I've worked with it as a crudo, but not breaking it down in uh, the way we are, the technique and the way we are cooking it. Mindy's a pro though, she knows what she's doing. Change is good and challenging and it's exciting to see something different every couple months. Like at least what we learned with the last menu, it takes a few days for it to kind of like neutralize. Chef, should we start uh, wrapping these fluke? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. I guess so, we're still trying to like figure out the best way for this to happen and we've kind of adjusted it as we've gone, you know, for the whole three days that we've been doing this. Seasoned with lemon thyme and lemon zest. We give it a layer of an escabeche zucchini and then the whole thing gets wrapped in blossoms. This looks really great for a crudo um, and not that it, we're slow kind of baking it essentially or slow cooking it, it's a little bit like a confit. Let's see what it looks like when we wrap it. Okay. Okay, and if you do it well, it should come together on the other side. We're gonna lose that one. And that's it. And it's just like a nice layer. And then we're gonna wrap it one more time just to like make it nice and tight. The first day I was like a little wonky with the plastic wrap, but day three, I'm a wizard. <laughs> we got six or seven more to go. Then we're gonna portion them. I would say like a filet like this is, I try to gauge it with like two to three fingers. We should be able to get like six portions out of this and then get ready for service. We actually cook it with the plastic. It separates itself. So if you look on the bottom side, there's like a gap in between the leaf and the fish. So we just lift and we can cut that way. There's definitely like two trains of thought. You know, like people go back to restaurants for specific things and specific dishes and that's great. And then people don't go back to restaurants because nothing changes and it's the same thing and they don't, they're just not interested in having the same thing over and over again. 
This is the second part of the lamb dish, but most importantly, this is James Brown, and he's the best, and he's very quiet. He's just Frenching the rack, so he's pulling the cap off and then cutting against the bones here and then uh, taking off any of the additional fat. Jason is on the meat roast, he's over there. He's doing like the finishing, portioning on the lamb, cleaning it up, getting the fat so that we can render it for lamb fat that we use to cook and sear the arrossoncini, which was the cook and the press that we did. We made a play on an Abruzzese street food called arrostoncino. It's a meat skewer that's usually made of mutton or sheep or lamb, and it gets served with a lamb chop and a, a dandelion salad. Traditionally, it has like tuna fish in it, and we use a tuna botarga to finish it. Like, do I want you to feel transported to a very specific place? Yes and no. I want you to feel like it touches on that place, but I don't necessarily need it to feel like, you know, I just stepped off an airplane and this is what I got. Uh, this is Renee. She's a nice sous chef on the pasta line, and she's processing uh, razor clams. And they go on the corn capoletti dish. We cut them into little discs so that they're pretty and fancy. We use the trim for the brown butter and black truffle sauce. The third course on the menu starts with the pasta courses. So this menu is a corn capoletti made with grano arso, which is like a burnt flour, corn and black truffle. So this is Carlos. We're gonna make this pasta. It's called a clergione. So the clergione, which was on our last menu, was such a favorite of everyone that we've decided to kind of keep it around. These are the clergione, so it's a Sardinian dumpling, and it is like a, a dumpling process. It's like a, a push and a pinch. The push and the fan and repeat. And repeat. The same for six, seven times, or you finish close, that's it. Carlos, how long have we worked together? It's a long time. <laughs> He was a mechanic previously, so, yeah, he, so he likes to tinker. To, yes. So now he just tinkers with dough. This was like the one thing that I've ever taught Carlos because he's like a pasta savant and it took a little while to get used to it. For now, it's easy, everything, what you're doing. <laughs> you have to overstuff and you have to be okay with the fact that like some of the filling is going to come out and it's not going to ruin it. From here, we'll bring these upstairs to the pasta station so that we have them for service tonight. They'll get cooked and then they get sauced with a, a jus of clams and mussels and served with razor clams and caviar. My partner Jeff and I did something a little crazy and we opened two restaurants instead of one. and. They're totally different. Mel's is a casual, loud, vibey pizzeria that is wood burning only. So we're in the Al Coro dining room. It's about 3.30 and we're gonna go over to Mel's to do a little work on some pizza. This is Tony. He's the chef at Mel's. So we opened this together and then I stepped away to open Al Coro and so he is here every day making sure everything's awesome because he's awesome. It's a naturally fermented dough. I think it's like 10% whole wheat. It's a three day process. We try to keep all the like toppings and stuff fun and seasonal. Tony has self-proclaimed has eaten a slice of pizza every day. Of every day life. of my life. Did you eat pizza on the days when we were like not doing pizza development? Every day. Yeah, at some point you just don't eat the crust. So our newest pizza on the menu, corn cacio pepe. We're gonna let him taste it for the first time. Put a lot of pecorino on it, corn that's cooked with uh, black pepper. What do you think? Everyone here tastes, and the same thing goes with next door. I need to know what you think about this so we know if it sucks or if it's great. This is Cat Rock. <laughs> Most importantly, she's my chef's cuisine. She does everything. And these are our Santa Barbara spot prawns. And then we process them, which some people maybe think is not so nice. What you're looking at here is about a third of what we actually received. So this was about 10 pounds. We got 30 pounds in for this week. That's fairly standard at this point. So we're cleaning them so that we can break them down for a crudo. I like cleaning the shrimp because it's like quiet. 
and you can space out for a few minutes and like get something done and it's kind of therapeutic, I guess. So we make a prawn oil with all of the, the heads and the shells. We blend them with uh, grapeseed oil and it makes this really aromatic oil. It's uh, gonna get loud. This is gonna go for a while. Also checking to just see in here that all the juices from the heads have sort of evaporated and fully cooked off into the oil. We have our first tables at 5.30, so I'm just finishing up some of the protein fabrication and I will be mincing the spot prawns that Chef and I fabricated earlier. Every time we start a new menu, the biggest challenge is definitely sourcing and availability is probably always the biggest challenge, but it's just a bigger challenge because it's a much shorter window of time. You know, you want to find products that feel right for the menu. And you also want to find things that are interesting and delicious and beautifully made. One of the biggest courses that we have is our Apper TV course, which consists of small dishes. The whole team, both here and at Mel's, are all here. Each line is a, a different thing. This is the Apper TV line, and then pasta, meat, and fish. We'll start seeing like the meat roast and the fish roast come up from the butchering room to start uh, getting ready for service. So most of the Apper TV stuff is a lot of like final finishing things, and then it'll all kind of be put together at 5.30 when we open. I mean, the calamari is one that's fun and it's a people pleaser and, and it's also one of those things that's really simple. So I'm just giving a quick blanch to the calamari. I'm not really trying to cook. You can see it's just a second or two. I'm just opening up the tubes so that when we fry them, the rings are nice and open. Danielle's gonna fire a tasting of Aper TV so that we can taste everything before we start sending food out to the dining room. Fire one. Fire one. So I kind of like those things as projects and calamari is kind of that. It's really nice calamari. It's not like the manufactured rubber bands. It's fried really nice and individually. Um, you're not getting like a plate full of little like tempura or like batter pieces instead of like an actual ring or tentacle. So this is the sauce for the calamari. It's just like a, it's a very lemony, peppery butter sauce. You want to taste this with me? Because the last one's a little salty, so I'm going to add a little pickling liquid. But like it has a lot of pepper in it, chili peppers or pickled peppers, and they're hot. Well, we have every day to make it perfect, right? So like we have until September 27th to, to dial it in. We're just about getting ready for service. It's 5.15. Everyone's setting up their stations. We open 5.30. Uh, we'll put up tastings of the Apera TV. If you look around, there's about two plus cooks on every station. They're just making last finishing touches for service this evening. They're about to bread some stuffed olives. Tomatoes are going towards the salad and slicing prosciutto for the melon. Well, this is part of the melon and prosciutto and it's the melon's gonna be kind of dehydrated to like a almost like fruit roll up consistency and that's part of the dish. This is first. That was the herb pizzelle with <laughs> some warts on and herbs. This one is a fried olive, it's stuffed with anchovy and has a lemon, parsley, uh, aioli. No, oh, it's good. Cantaloupe, fresh, dehydrated with prosciutto and lemon verbena oil. I feel like the this actual fresh melon is not so sweet or ripe as it has been. And I feel like it needs a little like marinating. And across the board, I feel like it could have more olive oil. This is polenta crisp with pigito crab and chili. Like this. You can give it a little lemon juice. I feel like it's a little soft. Uh, this is our baked fairy tale eggplant with semi secchi cherry tomatoes, capers, and breadcrumbs. There's a little pecorino fonduta on the bottom. I feel like you need to season the eggplant a little more. I do. I almost feel like I want to touch more acid. We were talking at one point about spritzing it with the vinegar. I definitely need more acid and a little more salt too. Okay. You want to taste the tomato? I really like it, but I need more everything. I think it's because it was too it spicy like, last night. It just tastes like tomatoes that need salt and acid. Your spice is fine. Spice is fine. 
I mean, it could even take a little more, but like uh, the seasoning is really off and you need more acid. It's, it needs everything, to be honest. It's just very flat. So let's remix the whole thing. So everything's pretty much like very close to where we want it to be. The tomato seasoning needs adjustment all around, but that's very easy to fix. Everything else is in a good place, so we're good to go for service. You know, running service in a place like this is a little shaky. There's a lot of moving pieces. It's a lot of people. It's a very big space. So I need five eggplant and five calamari. I have, you know, four lines in the kitchen and they're each dedicated to one thing. I try to run a reasonable kitchen. I know that sounds very silly, but like no one's running around like a psychopath, no one's yelling. No one's doing anything that I wouldn't be doing. I'm very, very hands-on. If you, you know, need help with your prep, like I'm the person that's there helping you. So it's very much like a team effort and it's a very loose brigade. Okay, you have the 10 top in, the honey allergy. All right, can we have hands for a pair of TV, please? I feel like everyone in, in the kitchen, regardless of experience, you know, has something to learn no matter what, including myself. Can you fire one taste color, Gione, please? So the way that we decided our, to change our menu is a little crazy, so we decided to rip the whole Band-Aid off. It's kind of fun. Fire prawn on 203, please. I don't feel like I'm pushing against fine dining. I just think that, like, I have some different views on how to go about it. I mean, I've been cooking in fine dining restaurants for, like, 15 years, most of my career. And there's a lot of, like, you know, things that you learn that they just are. It is this way because it, that is, like, what the expectation is. And I was like, well, I think like the expectation of how we dine and what we dine and what we believe it to be like has definitely changed a lot. I don't think that anything that we're doing is so obtuse or so against. I just think it is going at a different beat in a slightly different direction.